So now let me turn to the panel. Perhaps we'll start with uh, Albert. Uh, and I will invite Albert to say a few words about his role in the great project, how you came to be part of it, and what it's like to be part of the team. Albert. Okay, thank you very much. It's actually a great pleasure for me to be here and see this room full of people sitting on the stairs like... Uh, uh, we did a couple of days ago when the thing was uh, the Higgs was announced at CERN and also with the simultaneous broadcast we had here. So let me tell a bit what my role is in all this. Uh, first of all, I should say this is really something novel for me what I'm doing now. I'm giving a talk where I had the right of having only one transparency and that's the transparency you see there. <laughs> and that's actually uh, what could be a, a Higgs event candidate. So. What happens and where, where we come in, and so let me introduce the thing. I myself, I'm from Belgium, but I work at CERN, which is an international, but particularly European-oriented in terms of people that work there, organization, as far as the accelerators are concerned. At CERN in Geneva, Switzerland, we have a big machine. A machine that is 100 meters underground and 27 kilometers long. It's a tunnel of 27 kilometers in a circle. That's the accelerator called the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider. Hadron is a type of particle, but large and collider, I think, are, are clear what it means. <laughs> so what it does is we have in that machine two beams of particles, in fact, protons, protons which are part of the atoms. The nucleus of the proton is made of, uh, of the atom is made of protons and neutrons. The proton is charged. We can accelerate these. And we can make them go opposite direction until certain points where we make them clash on each other. And then that happens. What happens actually there is that here we have Einstein at work. Einstein's most famous formula, which is actually the most famous physics formula known in the world, I presume, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, but I presume in Australia as well, <laughs> is E equals mc squared. Energy and mass are related. We use the energy of that big machine which we have, which is the highest energy we can create at this point in time in the lab, uh, to create mass, to create particles coming out. There are two protons hitting each other, but you see many particles coming out. And in fact, we can produce heavy particles, much more heavy than the proton, because we convert the energy of the beams into mass. This is how a collider works. And that's needed. Because the particle we are actually looking for, we knew, is a particle that's going to be heavy, much more heavy than a proton. In fact, 125 times more heavy than the proton, as it turns out. But we did not know even in advance where exactly it would be. Now, what is this particle? This particle, well, details will be surely more explained by uh, my colleagues when they come here. But one important thing of this particle is to think of the following. It's actually teaching us something from the beginning of the universe. If we were at the beginning of the universe in the hot, dense soup of energy and particles that exist at the time, in the very beginning, particles were zapping around with the speed of light. That's very fast. That's 300,000 kilometers per second. Not much can happen to solidate, for example, being sitting here around. We would be all zapping around 300,000 kilometers per second. If not, some mechanism, some, something new was introduced that is slowing down things. And typically mass, as we know it, is an object that slows down, that resists to speed. Big trucks, you know, get on that speed much more slowly than a motorcycle, for example. So to have at the end that we are not having particles moving around with the speed of light, with this very fast speed, something had to be introduced in the very beginning of the universe. And that's the Higgs. But that was a postulation. We did not know that for sure. In fact, Higgs, Professor Higgs, when he uh, uh, formulated his theory in, in, uh, in a broader context, that was already, that's already you know, almost 50 years ago, he came up with the idea. Because it's a mathematically very nice trick to do that. But theories are only worth something when the experiment 
actually confirms the theory. And therefore, CERN as a laboratory and other laboratories before, like Fermilab, as you will hear, have been on the quest for this particle. We call it actually among us the holy grail of particles to look for. People outside first call it the God particle. We don't like that term so much, but I'll leave it to my colleagues to explain why we don't like it so much. And so how these experiments come about? These experiments come about built around colliders, like I said, like now we have the largest one in, in Geneva, which made it possible to actually see this particle uh, after only two years of operation, in fact. But particles is not enough. Uh, pardon, an accelerator is not enough. You need something that measures what is being produced. So you see, visualized what's coming out there. These are detectors. And the detectors we have for this project are huge. In fact, neither of the two main detectors, I represent one and the next speaker represents the second, would fit in this room. They are so big. And to give you an idea, the number of people that work in each of these experiments is over 3,000 to get this experiment to work, build it, operate it, and look for things. And the Higgs is one aspect we look for. It's one of our main aspects, but there are also other things we look for. So 3,000 people. Of the 3,000 people, at least in my experiment, uh, somehow like 700 were on the hunt for the Higgs. This is more than the number of people in the room here. Physicists all hunting for the last few years searching for this particle. And the last four or five months, many of these people did not get much sleep. Because we had the target. We had the target and that was this conference here. And people were really looking, analyzing the data, looking for events as we see there. And it's basically the green outcoming sites on the site, which are the photons which you see, which are a signature for a candidate of a Higgs particle being produced there. I simplify because it's much more difficult to find it in here. And in fact, we have billions of events corrected, collected, billions, tens of billions of events, and only about 100 of these collisions, of these 10 billion collisions, contain actually something interesting, which could be the Higgs particle. We saw some first hints last year already, and uh, now, we needed this year to have a real good set of data to actually come to what we see now. And we were, of course, extremely happy that uh, when, just before the conference, I knew it like two weeks before you that we saw the Higgs, but not much more. So then we were sure we had it and we could go out and present it to the community here. And just to finish, I thought that once we've done that, we can actually take a rest and sleep but the last two, three days have been very, very hectic. And uh, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I'm happy that we are, we are there. And uh, you know, I think uh, I'll stop there and leave the floor to one of my colleagues. No, but thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, Stephen, over to you. And perhaps I could uh, ask you to start in uh, outreach mode and give us a quick explanation of what a Higgs boson is and why is it important. Please. Okay. Okay. okay, so uh, first of all, I'm very fortunate because Albert told you everything. <laughs> so I can say whatever I want now. Uh, Atlas is the experiment, as was already explained uh, by Albert, there, there were four different places around this ring where there are collisions going on. CMS sits on one end, and completely opposite is the Atlas detector. And we've been keeping separate from each other for the past several weeks, uh, because neither one of us actually wanted to see the other's data. That was rather important, because these 3,000 people on CMS, 3,000 people on ATLAS are probably the most important differences in these experiments. Uh, that being that you have a completely different set of people working on a problem and using their ideas, using their thoughts, their own ability to think, uh, coming up with how to measure this, this, this beast, this, this, this particle. 
Uh, keeping them separate was, was great, and we did not want to see what the others were doing because that might have biased us. So we only found out, and we were with all of our colleagues all together when we saw each other's results a few days ago, and that thrilled us. Uh, but what was more thrilling to me was just after that, seeing the excitement on the faces of people who didn't know anything about particle physics, uh, seeing the headlines, seeing a place like this filled with people who want to know what's going on, what are you doing? Uh, that amazed me. So I'll put on my education and outreach hat for you because uh, this is important. This is big, and everyone seemed to recognize it as being big. Uh, we do find particles from time to time. Uh, CMS has already discovered uh, a particle recently that you didn't know about. Uh, Atlas found one. Uh, our friends at LHCB, another experiment, uh, on the ring, on the, on, on the LHC, also found a couple, but you guys might not have even noticed it in the news. Uh, it was because we knew they were coming. We have a model that was so good, these theorists, we hate it when they're, when they're right, but they've been right for 50 years, and uh, they gave us a beautiful model, and with that we could predict things. So when we found these other particles, we weren't surprised. We knew what their masses were going to be. We knew that they were going to be there. That's pretty amazing, actually. But what happened just recently, a few days ago, uh, was really incredible. That someone could come up with the idea of a mechanism that gives mass uh, to other particles, something to explain a problem in a way which us experimental, well, maybe a few of the smart experimentalists like Albert can understand, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and give us concrete things that we could measure uh, to, to look for it, is, is, doesn't happen that often. Uh, the beginning of this model was back in, the, in the, the early 60s, when we decided that electricity and magnetism could be joined with a nuclear force. That was a brilliant step forward. But even more impressive was that by adding this Higgs mechanism, they predicted some particles, some carriers of force, at exactly their right masses. And that began, I call it the, sort of the miracles of the standard model, but it also turned us into, um, well, some somewhat blasé physicists. We got used to it very quickly. They predicted uh, in, the, in the 80 that we would, in the 60s, they predicted that we would find a couple carriers of the force. In 1983, we found them at exactly where they were supposed to be. From that time forward, we've been able to do that. And one of the things that's always amazed me was that we were so confident at the end of the running of the accelerator before this, we called up our friends uh, in Chicago, where there was another accelerator being built, told them, congratulations, you're building an accelerator, and that accelerator is going to find the sixth and final quark, and here's what its mass is going to be. And they said, okay, thanks, and then they found it, and there were no headlines. <laughs> there weren't people, we, we were interested. We were definitely interested. People in the physics community wanted to know it, but what they started doing right away with it was saying, okay, now that we know that, which we already knew, but now we have a measurement, now we can start trying to find the Higgs because that will help us to do it. So it was, it, it was known that it would be there. That was because of this work, because of the theorists, because of the work of, of, of Higgs and Englert and, and, and Brut, uh, that we were able to make these predictions. And finding that particle, though, that marked, I think, the biggest step. A huge step. And uh, I won't, I think, I'm not going to go complete detail about how it works. Essentially, you have a field. When a particle goes through that field, uh, it accumulates mass. How much it couples with that field is what gives a particle, a, a, an elementary particle, mass. Uh, if it goes through easily, it, it has less mass, if it, you know, like a truck, it's going to get more mass, etc. Uh, and this particle that we found, the Higgs particle, is just a manifestation of that, something that helps to, to, to uh, get the idea through. I think I'll let the theorists explain exactly how the mechanism works. Uh, so 
What I would like to say, uh, actually, which I think is, is very important about all this, is that you, I'm, I'm very happy that everyone has recognized the significance of finding this. Uh, we don't like to call it the God particle. In fact, you should know, if I dare say so, that the actual name that was given to it by Leon Letterman was the goddamn particle, <laughs> simply, <laughs> simply because he'd been looking for it forever, and we have been looking for it forever, and, and we hadn't found it. But uh, the publisher of his book refused to call the book the goddamn particle, and so we got stuck with this thing. We're not so pretentious. Uh, we're very humble about looking for, th for work. We're humble in many ways, and, and one of the ways is because we know that we're representing all of you. Uh, every single one of you has played a major, major role in this discovery. Every one of you, because of your enthusiasm, because you are interested in science, uh, you want things to, to happen in science, you express that enthusiasm to friends, you get them excited in science, uh, that's what keeps the world doing what we're supposed to do. Uh, human beings, uh, when you look at them in detail, you'll see that they have a few things they have to do. And one of them is they have to eat. Another is they have to make babies. And a third is that they have to understand the world around them. It's just inside us. We have to do that. Let's face it, we're slow, uh, we're tasty morsels. Uh, we would have disappeared a long time ago if we didn't do that. It's essential to our species that we do the work that we're doing when we do this research. And I think that's why that resonates in everyone when they see that we've made a fundamental discovery that suddenly has allowed us to understand uh, the universe more We've done something for our entire species which will allow us to continue more. It will allow us to have a better view of what we have to do next. It's a major block in our understanding. Human beings, by doing basic research, do a few things. One is to add information, knowledge about what we've done. We add that knowledge up and that accumulates and we, we can do things on top of that knowledge. But I think even more so, more important than that, there are times in history where we change the way we think. And that's what's exciting. And it's hard to recognize these, but sometimes there's these people like a simple patent clerk uh, who says, hey, if something's going close to the speed of light, it doesn't behave like we normally see it. It does something different. Uh, it doesn't... Uh, it doesn't behave like you normally see things behave. Okay, when you see when you're walking around, you don't go close to the speed of light. You suddenly have to think differently. The same thing happened when a friend of his, uh, Niels Bohr, came up with this really strange idea about quantum mechanics. A whole different way of thinking. And this gets reflected in all of the things that we think about after that time. By finding and understanding that the Higgs mechanism is correct, and we don't yet know that. We're, we, we think we're going to know that. We don't yet know that for sure. We know we found something, and it looks a little bit like the Higgs, and smells a bit like the Higgs, and we think it's probably the Higgs. We'll know that soon. Uh, we have to do a few more measurements. But once we have that, we've made that major advance. We have a bit of knowledge, but we also have a way of thinking about the universe that's, that's confirmed, and it's different than what we had before. And so I think that's a major, major thing. And I want to thank all of you for supporting our research and ask you to please continue to have the enthusiasm to support what we're doing. So I'd like to uh, hand the microphone over to Raman here. Um, You've published uh, a number of uh, uh, papers with Lisa Randall. Um, in fact, these papers have become so famous, I think they're just known by the uh, initials um, uh, uh, RS number one and RS number two. And some of the present company may have heard uh, Lisa Randall speak here in 2005. But can I ask you, um, uh, 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 
to give us a, a bit of an overview, and in particular, what is this uh, supersymmetry? And more particularly, we've heard a lot about the Higgs boson. There are two guys there, Higgs, we've seen a lot. But who was this other guy, Bose? Please. OK. Um, so I have my prepared remarks, but I'll try and answer those questions as well. Um, so I'm the only guy on the panel who actually brought my equipment with me. Um, so I'm the lone theorist here. Um, so, so let's see. I'll answer those questions in, in the context. I wanted to say a few things about the specifics of the discovery, but also really to just uh, put the discovery in context and maybe you know, provide some ammunition for questions. Um, and I should say that uh, particles like the Higgs boson or the top quark, these are for us a, the sort of alphabet in the story that we tell. And uh, like you know, a professional calligrapher would love each particular alphabet, we love every particular particle. And a lot of attention is spent this week on the, the discovery of this one new alphabet, the, the, the Higgs boson. Um, but besides their sort of individual character and distinction, uh, I think their true significance is in their collective behavior. Okay, so with the 26 alphabet or letters of the alphabet, you can write Shakespeare. With the letters of DNA, we can create, uh, or, or life knows how to create itself. Um, for us, particle physics is really um, the idea of cracking the genetic code of the universe, okay? The basic laws through which it is uh, constructed and evolves. Um, and, uh, and there's an emerging theme that we've now seen over decades of research, roughly about a century of research, um, which is that a lot of the macroscopic diversity that we see and are part of um, is really uh, underlain by, by a really shocking unification of um, energy and matter. And this, uh, this, unifi this unity is something that when you appreciate it is something very beautiful, okay? It's like great music, great art. Um, so one question of where, I, you know, uh, I think all of us were asked how we got into physics is uh, when I was an undergrad at Sydney Uni, oops, I've let that out of the bag. <laughs> um, I, uh, I actually, I think it was in my, uh, what we'd call in America the junior year, but here the third year of undergrad, where I had to do an essay or something, and um, I ran upon the mathematics of this subject, particle physics, and it blew me away. Um, and I didn't actually know there was a subject called particle physics, even though I'd been studying physics for a few years by then. Uh, and I asked around, and they told me, that, yeah, this thing has a name. It's called particle physics, and, and, and that's sort of how I got into the subject. Um, but basically, the grammar of this subject is given by quantum mechanics and relativity, these two bizarre things that, however, give us everything that we take for granted. Um, and it's really striking the continuity of effort that physicists have put in decade after decade to try and understand this beautiful unity that underlies the diversity that we see. Um, you know, when I was a kid, again, in Australia, uh, I was uh, very taken by creation myths. Uh, I used to read about Greek mythology, Indian mythology, Norse mythology, and about uh, you know, how the universe came to be, as, as told by people either hundreds or thousands of years ago. And uh, of course, the forces of nature were always a sort of family of contentious gods. And, uh, and in particle physics, what we found is that there's something like that. The forces of nature actually have family-like relations and there's even a kind of a family tree that seems to be emerging. Um, the Higgs boson is significant because it, it, it's part of um, what we'd call electroweak unification. Um, and basically, the youngest of the forces that were born soon after the Big Bang were um, electromagnetism and the weak nuclear force that underlies radioactivity. And we have sort of very compelling evidence that they fit into something called an electroweak unified theory. Um, and of course, if you say that there's some sort of unified theory, then why were we ever talking about electromagnetism and the weak nuclear forces, two separate things? And the answer is because this fundamental unity is hidden. It's partially hidden. It's only partially hidden so that with enormous detective work, we could figure out that there was actually a unification. But there has to be an agent that hides it. And uh, basically, 
this unity, fundamental unity, is, is veiled by an all-pervasive field in space. And that's the Higgs field, okay? That's its significance to me, is that it, it's covering up, hiding a little bit, this great truth that there's unity uh, between the electromagnetic and weak forces. Um, this field sort of came into existence in our universe uh, very in the few instants after the Big Bang, as the universe expanded and cooled. Uh, and it came into existence in the same sense that if you take uh, water vapor and you cool it, it condenses into uh, liquid water, okay? So some sort of cooling like this happened in the early universe and gave rise to what's called the Higgs condensate. Um, so let me just say a little bit about the, what I make of the discovery. Um, I think, you know, the, the job of actually testing this fantastic story I just told you uh, is, is, is really to try and isolate the sort of Lego block of this Higgs field that, as I say, pervades all of space. We are like fish in water, asking, where's the water, okay? And the idea is you want to isolate one atom of it. And the Higgs boson, a single Higgs boson particle, is the particle that makes up the Higgs field, very much like photons, are the quantum particles that make up an electromagnetic wave or light beams. Um, the name boson actually comes from the physicist, uh, the Indian physicist Bose, uh, who played with Einstein a crucial part in determining the behavior of at least half of the particles of nature, the so-called bosons. And um, they have a special property. They can be put into a special state that creates force fields. So when we discover the Higgs boson, we're actually discovering a new force of nature. You were, you were taught in high school probably that there's electromagnetism, the weak nuclear force, the strong nuclear force, and gravity, four forces. Well, this week, we got a fifth force, and that's the, the Higgs force. It's a short-range force like the weak nuclear force, and it's very exciting, okay? The, the, the high school books have to change now. Um, so, have we really got it? Well, I would say no. We, to be more cautious, we've found a particle. And uh, this particle is a boson. And um, the evidence strikes me as being reasonably compelling that it is a Higgs boson, um, meaning it plays this role of veiling electroweak unification from the naked eye, but not to expert detectives like the experimentalists. Um, the if you often hear called the Higgs boson, and the the refers to what I call the minimal standard model, the theory which discusses all of this in the fewest moving parts. But we don't really know yet that it is the minimal theory. And in fact, uh, there are reasons to think that maybe we go beyond the minimal theory. And I just want to quickly sketch a few reasons that maybe might elaborate in questions. Um, so for example, again, taking the cos cosmological evolutionary point of view, we know, uh, or we have very, very strong reasons to believe, that um, matter and antimatter, which are sort of twin species born of relativity and quantum mechanics, uh, had a war of mutual annihilation in the very early universe, okay? Almost all the matter and antimatter annihilated each other into pure energy, but a tiny sliver of matter survived this war and all our galaxies and all of you are made of that tiny sliver. And we'd like to know what tipped the balance in this almost perfectly matched set of evil twins fighting it out in the first moments of creation. And, uh, and it may well be that the process of Higgs condensation I talked about earlier uh, is crucial in understanding what tipped the balance, but only if the Higgs structure is non-minimal. Okay, so we're very eager to continue experiments like this to find out whether that's the case or not. Um, when you find a new force, like the Higgs force, you can ask, what can you do with it? Um, and one of the things we'd like to do is use it to catch dark matter. So we know that most of the matter in the universe is actually not made of the usual stuff you and I are made of, electrons and protons and neutrons. It's made of something we don't actually understand yet. And, but it's possible that the Higgs force is something that we can use in dark matter detection to catch it. And this week, we finally know the range, the incredibly short range of that force. A um, Couple of more things. We also know that the Higgs mechanism is a, uh, 
prototype for an even grander unification. In fact, we just call it grand unification for the unification of electromagnetism, the weak nuclear force, and the strong nuclear force emerging at an even earlier instant after the Big Bang. And uh, we now know, because of the mass of the particle seen, if it indeed is a Higgs boson, and I say the evidence is reasonably compelling, um, that the mass of about 130 proton masses is favorable for this kind of grand unification scenario. Whereas, for example, if the mass of the Higgs boson had turned out to be, say, 500 times the proton mass, which it might have been, then that would have been disfavorable for this idea of grand unification. So the details that we're learning really matter to the huge story of cosmology and, uh, and, and the, basically the way the world works and the story of unity. Um, there are other ideas out there. For example, when people study this, the minimal standard model, uh, theorists see a kind of imperfection, uh, which I, I can discuss in, in question time, but, but basically there are reasons to think that there's an enhanced structure. Uh, ideas like supersymmetry are one such structure. Supersymmetry is again an addition, a possible conjectured addition to the grammar of particle physics. The grammar being set by quantum mechanics and relativity thus far. Supersymmetry is a very beautiful possible addition to that grammar which would help us understand aspects of the standard model which are still mysterious, the so-called hierarchy problem. Um, the discovery of the Higgs, or whatever this particle is, at, uh, at the mass that it is, is actually vaguely troubling for the idea of supersymmetry. So a lot of us theorists are, are wrestling with how to accommodate in supersymmetric theories uh, the, the exact details of this discovery. Um, Finally, I should say that the actual mass that this particle has shown up at is actually very opportune for studying, for hunting for new types of physics. Because this particle decays, and we can see it decay, in a number of different possible ways. And it can be produced in a number of different possible ways, which are roughly competitive. So we can study, it's like both being able to see you and to hear you and, you know, if you're close enough to smell you, that if you have enough different ways of sensing something, you have a much better image of what it is. And at this mass, that turns out to be very favorable. So we're very excited to be able to study this in great detail as we uh, move forward. Um, so uh, let me just say on the, on the side of the human achievement, just finally, that that this is um, really an incredible and I think a long-lasting uh, human achievement. I mean, it'll be something that is known 300 years from now uh, when, uh, you know, the you know, American politics and the presidential election and so on have, have gone away. Uh, so I think it's, to me, it's as shocking as this particle is. I'm, I'm really also equally shocked by the perseverance and ingenuity of the physicists uh, in, in pulling it off. And remember, this is something that has been sustained over several generations. To me, that's like, you know, creating a kind of modern pyramid dedicated to human understanding. And um, unlo we don't have a pharaoh to say, you know, you better do it. So, so really, you know, this had to contend with governments changing many times, funding, public sentiment, uh, politics, all of that. And yet in this case, against all those odds, uh, international cooperation triumphed in a way that I find just uh, mind-blowing, as mind-blowing as the physics itself. So congratulations to those who pulled it off, and uh, I'll stop right there. So now I'd like to invite our fourth uh, panelist uh, forward, Young Ki. Uh, perhaps you could uh, tell us something about the pathway from uh, Korea to Fermilab in the USA and something about the great and friendly rivalry between the, uh, the two labs. Okay, so as you can see, I am short. <laughs> so actually, I was very uh, pleasantly surprised to see so many uh, Asians uh, in, in this room and also in the Melbourne city around. So uh, this was a quite surprising uh, and also very pleasant. So, um, so you, you want me to say about my pathway? Uh, I don't want to say so much, but uh, uh, you know, I was born in South Korea and 
small village with uh, four sisters and one brother, so big family. But anyhow, I grew up at countryside and went to high school and bigger city and my college education was the biggest city in Korea, so that's Seoul. Then I came to United States uh, from my uh, PhD. So that's how uh, I came to United States um, for my uh, the PhD degree on, on and, and now I'm teaching at the university and then also a deputy director at uh, uh, Fermilab. Fermilab is uh, the uh, U.S. national laboratory, uh, primarily dedicated to particle physics. So you heard uh, from David that there's some r rivalry going on between Fermilab and, and uh, CERN. So let me tell you a little bit about Fermilab. First of all, you saw the, all the standard model elementary particle list in the previous slide. Uh, so for, out of all those particles, Fermilab discovered the three particles. So one is, if you remember, there's a three kind of neutrinos. In the table, it was a kind of three. Ah, it was there. So three types of neutrinos. By the way, these neutrinos are uh, everywhere in, in the universe. In fact, every second, about trillions of neutrinos zip through your body every second. But you don't feel anything, right? It's because they are very, very elusive. So there are the three kinds, and, and tau leptons, the last one, was discovered at Fermilab year 2000. And we have, uh, by the way, uh, many kinds of uh, accelerators uh, simultaneously running because we are doing different kind of uh, uh, the physics uh, and the particle physics research and using different kind of accelerators. So we have, uh, in fact, the world most uh, powerful and diverse neutrino uh, beam accelerators still going on. And uh, secondly, we discovered the bottom quark. You'll see B, uh, spelled B. That was discovered by uh, Leon Nederman in 1978. And the top quark, which is uh, the heaviest quark ever observed. So you heard that Higgs boson uh, mass is about 125 times the proton mass. That top quark uh, mass is about 172 times proton mass. So you see that how heavy that is. However, these, are, these particles are uh, so-called fundamental particles or elementary particles. That means that they are the smallest things we ever seen. And they are not made of even smaller things. So at the scale of how small they are, they are smaller than, you know, nanometer is a tiny. This is, a, we are talking about nano, nanometers. So that tiny scale uh, size particles, but it's, it's way is huge. The top core case, as I said, about 172 times the proton mass. So these are the three particles that Fermilab discovered. But going back to a little bit, we talked about this uh, God particles. So let me, I'm sure that there are many stories. By the way, this is uh, the book called The God Particle, written by Leon Lederman, who discovered the, uh, the bottom quark and the second, the neutrino. Uh, muon type neutrino he discovered and he got Nobel Prize. And he is a, was the second uh, director of a Fermilab. So, of course, the goddamn particle, god particle, I'm sure that's one story, and, and, and I'm sure there are many stories, but one of the stories I think he said to us is that uh, the publisher of the, the, uh, the book, after he wrote it, uh, he said that if you call it god, part, god particle, then probably many people will buy the book. So it's a purely economic <laughs> reasons. That's, that's one story. So I, I don't know which is a really true story, but any, anyway, that's that. So I said the number of uh, the uh, accelerators uh, simultaneously running at Fermilab, but one of uh, the accelerator uh, was called the Tevatron. This is a, a predecessor of LSC. The size-wise circumference is uh, six kilometers. Uh, LSE is a proton and proton collider. Uh, Tevatron is a proton and it's an antiparticle called antiproton. So proton and antiproton collider. And the energy is about a factor of uh, four, times, four times smaller than LSE. But of course, Tevatron was a predecessor of LSE and it started running in 1985. Uh, we uh, completed its operations year. 2011. In fact, last uh, September we turned it off because we have a now uh, bigger and, and a more powerful machine, uh, LSC start running. Talking about uh, the uh, uh, 
anti-proton. Anti uh, I don't know, you're probably uh, very familiar with, with the movie called Angels and Demon, right? So there's a lot of antimatter there, right, in, in the movie. Who made it? Where was uh, that film located or, or filmed? It was a son. In fact, the, uh, the not CERN, but Fermler is the, the one who produced the most antiparticle, but anyway. <laughs> so that's the story. So yes, there was a little bit of rival, even though Tevatron was an earlier version of, of LSC, and LSC is certainly more powerful. But several things that I can say about uh, Tevatron's uh, the, uh, contribution to this uh, particle Higgs boson. First of all, I told you about top core, which was discovered at Fermilab, and another particle, uh, which is quite heavy, but not as heavy as top core, about half of a top mass. That's called the W boson, which was discovered at CERN in 1982. These two very, very massive particles, so we studied uh, in details with, using uh, the Tevatron. In fact, we measured uh, its mass, mass of top quark and mass of uh, W boson, very, very precisely. By doing so, uh, if you use a standard model of particle theory, we can predict the mass value of a Higgs boson. We cannot, unfortunately, we cannot predict very, very accurately, but we can give a sort of a range of uh, mass where Higgs should be if a standard model is a correct theory. Uh, from that measurement, Tevatron concluded that Higgs boson should be uh, less than about 140 times the proton mass. And, and uh, uh, let's discover at uh, Higgs mass of 125 times the proton mass. So we, we agree quite each other. So that's one contribution that uh, Tevatron made. And, and that also tells us that so far, standard model of particle theory works very well. Another contribution uh, that Tevatron made regarding Higgs, uh, the discovery or Higgs, uh, the uh, field, is that the Higgs at 125 times proton mass, uh, that mass range, the Higgs can decay to all different kind of daughter particles. In fact, a standard model can tell you Higgs can decay to this set of particles, how up the rate, and then another kind of a daughter particle is a different rate. So standard model can predict exactly how often Higgs decay, decay into each uh, decay mode. And the LSC, uh, Atlas and CMS discovered uh, Higgs boson in the two DK modes. And in Fermilab, so Tevatron actually is uh, very strong and sensitive to looking at another kind of DK uh, mode or daughter particles. And then we looked at it, in fact. Uh, then we found a quite tantalizing hint of Higgs decaying to that specific uh, final state or daughter particles. And also mass of the Higgs was consistent with uh, the uh, LSC discovery. So that's another uh, the contribution that uh, Tevatron has made. Um, right now, Tevatron shut down, and we continue to run the accelerators that uh, we have been running, but even uh, much more enhanced, the more capable machines right now by shutting down Tevatron, we can utilize some of those components and enhance other kind of accelerators. As I mentioned, that we have a very uh, powerful, uh, diverse, very intense beams of neutrinos, uh, and that intensity is even much greater right now than before. And then we are also creating new kind of particle beams to study uh, other parts of the uh, particle physics. Um, you heard a little bit that the standard model uh, itself so far works beautifully. Uh, you know, there are many measurements made at the laboratories and explained uh, in this framework of standard model. However, it does not explain a number of big questions. Uh, you heard that dark matter uh, cannot be explained by, the, by a standard model. Another big discovery made about 15 years ago is that uh, the universe which has been expanding and, and we thought that maybe the expansion is slows down, but it turns out that uh, accelerating. Uh, they could be related to a, a new kind of energy. We call it dark energy. 
or it could be just a lack of our understanding in the uh, gravity. But nevertheless, we have to understand that, and that's a big question. Another question why we are the universe that we live in is dominated by matter and what happened to uh, the, the antimatter. That kind of questions really remained uh, and standard model cannot answer. It's a firm that's uh, these new accelerators really going after number of questions that cannot be answered by standard model, which is uh, the uh, things we are doing at Fermilab uh, cannot be done by uh, the Large Hadron Collider. <laughs>